Eddie, hello. Hello, James. We've known each other forever and, you know, we've been best friends for 15 plus years. We, we lived together in LA. Years. When... That's, pretty, uh, that's pretty, you're aging really well, mate. I know. I, well, listen, in a way we probably, we look better than we did when we, when we met probably. In, in, in many ways, there's some pretty terrible hair going on. <laughs> I've got the photo. Actually, just before this, I, I was just trying to work out what year it was that we were living in LA. And it was 2009. I found some quite epic yeah. photos. Why? Well, I, I, the way I remember that it was 2009 is because, <laughs> you know, let's set the scene a little bit. You know, we weren't working a great deal. We were, uh, we were going up at for, all. yeah, let's, okay. We weren't working at all. We we're going up for um, a lot of stuff in LA. Um, a lot of the same stuff sometimes. Yeah. But we did manage to have fun. And I think we lived together for about three months. And there was so little to do if because we, we weren't working. And if we didn't have an audition, the reason I remember it was 2009, one day we went to like a, a, like a pottery barn or something. And we made, <laughs> <laughs> we made. Like, I've still got it. Some, I've still got it. Yeah. Yeah. We made some crockery. We made like plates made, and some um, clay. Yeah. And clay pots. And I remember we wrote like the names of all of these actors who we, we were all, all of our gang that we were hanging about, out, out with. I, I mean, everyone has done pretty good on it when you consider it. We've got two superheroes in there. You've got a, a Academy Award. I mean, it's kind of a, kind of insane. And uh, none of us were really having a great time of it then. Making pottery was kind of a high point. I mean, I'm slightly embarrassed that you're putting that out <laughs> into the public arena, given I used to tell my parents that I was going to LA in January to, you know, I was sort of endlessly you know, slaving away to try and get work, which to be fair, it was, but it just wasn't that, it wasn't that forthcoming. Although I was trying to remember the other, you and, you and Andrew Garfield and I were texting, trying to remember what those things were. And one of them was Bioshock. Do you remember Bioshock? It was like a, it was a, and we were furious with each other as we were going, going to, competing for the same role. I, I, um, and just the other day when we were texting, I think I went to check whether they were, it still hasn't been made, but. I was like texting my agent. <laughs> is there a Me, I like we are definitely too old for Bioshock now. If it comes back around, you, I think you genuinely got really, really close. And I was busy telling you how one. I was probably helping you with the lines. To be honest, I'd fallen out of the first hurdle. You know what? It's one of those things now that, like, I've had this experience now where back in the day when I wasn't working so much, I would, in my head, I was close and my agent was telling me I was close, I was down to one person. And then that project would come up and I'll be talking about it at dinner with someone and go, oh, yeah, it was between so and so and him and so and so to get the part. And I was like, oh. <laughs> I was like, oh, I thought it, I thought it was between, I thought it was between me and that me, person. And me. <laughs> and you. I remember a horrendous moment though. Also, like, it, what, what I look back on it as so joy, like, wonderful, was that we were, you just went up for everything and anything. And I'd get a script yeah. that was, I remember auditioning for Ten Thousand BC, which involved being topless, running oh. around like Egypt, and I was like. Has, ha, have they even, I mean, did look at me. I was sort of pallid, white, moly. I, 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 but, but you would turn up, you'd wander, drive around LA. I was always like two hours early or an hour late to auditions. So we're <laughs> endlessly running these kind of, these lines. But it, it was great in the sense that you got to try everything and fail hard, but your mates were there to, to kind of pick you up afterwards and take you to, to do some totally. pottery. But there's just so much, so much failure. And I, I just remember like, you know, rental car and then you had your, your uh, passenger, right. front passenger seat. And then that sort of foot area of the front passenger seat was just a sea of failed audition sides that you were just like chucking them down there after coming out of one of those auditions going, it's another fail. From the second you arrived in LA, you went hardcore on rental. You'd come with a bit of modeling money. You were like driving around in some swanky thing. Whereas I went to the, I would go to the, to the, to the rental car that you had to take a bus for about three hours from the airport to get and arrive in this little red, uh, red sort of. Oh mate, your red one. I'll never forget your red, your red one. And then one year you were invited, we got invited to some sort of, to some sort of Oscars watching party or something, and everyone turned up with their valet, <laughs> and I turned up with my little red car. 
<laughs> got sort of you were trying, trying to, 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 to have my keys out of the valley. Yeah. You were trying to be very tactical when you left because we were talking to quite cool people and you didn't want them to see what uh, car you had. And you were like, no, I actually think I forgot something that I'm going to stick around. I was like, no, Eddie, like, you know, front up, like, get your car. <laughs> We've come a long way since those days. And, you know, I, we are very, I feel so privileged that, uh, you know, I, and I know obviously you have an element of choice in, in what we do work-wise. You have a bit of say over your own moves you know rather than like just auditioning for stuff or hoping to get something how are you about picking what you do and do you have do you kind of just wait for something that that sort of moves you i feel like what was so what's so riveting and slightly kind of screwed up about the world uh, the, the, in some ways is you go from literally having no choice you know you, we, we would audition for everything or I would anyway, like audition for everything that, that came my way I, 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 and anything I got, I would do. And you were very much treated like a certain way within, um, you know, respectfully by casting directors, less so by others. You know, you could tell ones that believed in you, others that, that, that didn't. And then, and then what happened to me was overnight one film kind of changed that. And suddenly it's not like overnight you've become a substantially better actor, you've just been lucky getting an extraordinary part with a great director wonderful co-stars and something an alchemy in filmmaking has worked and then suddenly as you say you you have choice in fact i know there are much more kind of uh, rigorous act or, not, or actors who have more faith in themselves who from the word go would be turning things down even for auditions even if they didn't necessarily have the clout but for me that was always a kind of massive learning curve and nowadays it tends to be like purely instinct and the times when I go against instinct. So if I'm reading a script, if I, if it, if it reads quickly and it, and it sticks with me and makes me a little bit scared, then, then it, that tends to be, uh, Alfred Molina always used to say this beautiful thing that it's the second when you're reading a script and then halfway through you feel slightly sick in your stomach and it's because you're suddenly picturing yourself doing it. And, and with that comes the nerves and the, and, and I, I would agree with that. That's kind of, the 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 moment one of the questions i wanted to ask you is because you know millie um your wife who i adore and who wrote the music for your film which is so beautiful yeah i mean what a crazy thing that we end up doing this film together and that she ended up doing the score for one more time and it really is it's so beautiful I, I met millie first of all years ago she's also an extraordinarily accomplished actress when we were auditioning for something together and I wondered how much, given that that's her background and her taste generally, and that as an actor, when you make a choice to go and work on something, it's a kind of family choice in some ways. Does, does she read scripts with you? What are your instincts? I'm the same as you. I'm, I'm gut, I'm instinct. Often you can be uh, allured and by the siren of this great producer, this great director, or this, this jazzy actor's already doing it. And, you know, and there's some things that are no brainer. The Kenneth Branagh thing I've just done, it was Kenneth Branagh and Judy Dance is playing my mother. Those were like the two of the things I knew about it before. I was like, of course I'm doing it. I don't, of course I'm doing it. You know, I worked with Killian Murphy uh, about five years ago now in a movie called Anthropoid. And Killian has a thing about reading scripts. He calls yeah. it like the, the, the kettle uh, effect. And it's like, if at any point you're reading this script and you're meant to be like engrossed in for two hours of your yeah. life, if at any point you're like, particularly early, if you're like, I might just put the kettle on. Like, yeah, yeah, I might make a cup of tea. You don't want to do it. Who are the other people who have been most influential um, to you with regards to your work, whether it's writers, directors, actors. I, I was so sporty as a kid that I thought that that would kind of be my path, but also did, you know, youth theatre and did drama at school and stuff. So it was, it was a, bit, a, a bit of both. And um, But I certainly wasn't one, you know, going like, oh, I'm going to be an actor one day. And when that sort of became, you know, a reality for me, I'd always had built up all this admiration for people from home who were doing it, you know. I have admiration for actors that I'd love to work with and stuff, and, and definitely directors and, uh, and and writers who I respect and love, you know, like Paul Thomas Anderson, you know, the, 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 the sort of tone of his movies. I mean, you'd love to find yourself in one of his movies. But I always think putting that stuff out there is a little bit dangerous because the reality yeah. is, 
it probably won't happen, you know, and you, it, it's tricky. It's why I never answer that question. I think I probably answered it a couple of times early on in my career, but definitely I don't know. Or if someone says like, what's your dream role? Or is there like a character in a book or a character in a movie? I'm like, I can't answer that because like, I don't want to put that out there because chances are it won't even happen. And there probably are people I'd love to get a stab at playing, but the reality is it, it probably won't happen. And I don't think, I think it's dangerous to live, to, to have, a plan, a, even a plan in our parents. Like it's so random and you don't know what's going to happen next. And that is part of the major excitement about it is the unknown of not even knowing what world you're going to inhabit next year, what continent it's going to be inhabited on. We want to underscore again that we're coming to Chicago peacefully, but whether we're given permits or not, we're coming. The trial of the Chicago 7 um, and your portrayal of Thomas Hayden, I have to start by saying I didn't know a lot about that trial um, and I love that when you go into a movie and you don't really uh, know what you're expecting. I knew what I was expecting roughly in terms of the, the, the sort of tone of the movie but I didn't know anything about the actual events. You are brilliant in it as you are in everything you do. I remember talking to you when that role was coming about when you were nearly going to do that movie and everything got pushed back you obviously yeah. were very excited about it. Um, how was your experience making that movie? Uh, thanks, mate. Thanks um, for being kind about it. It was, I mean, I think you you know that um, that Aaron Sorkin has always been someone that I've sort of um, loved and whose work I've been kind of mildly obsessed with. So it genuinely was one of those um, those moments when this script arrived that it sort of felt too good to be true. And I kind of said yes before even reading the thing, or I was just willing it to be brilliant. There was actually that slight um, hesitation, actually, when you kind of really love someone's work, you can't quite believe that they've I invited you to the the party, and then there's the kind of fear of what if it's their um their, their you know their um <laughs> what if it's, what if it's the one shoddy one they do uh, because I have done that I've worked with like brilliant actors who never do bad films except for the film I do. <laughs> so, uh, Let's but... take ourselves back about ten years ago. The West Wing was the only television show you'd ever watched in your life, um, and you were just like obsessed with it uh, but you, you were admitted I, that it was the only thing you'd ever watched so it's such a lovely thing that that came around that you got to uh work with him my problem is that for the next 50 years when people think of progressive politics they're gonna think of you they're gonna think of you and your idiot followers passing out daisies to soldiers and trying to levitate the pentagon so they're not gonna think of equality or justice they're not gonna think of education or poverty or progress, they're gonna think of a bunch of stone lost, disrespectful, foul mouthed, lawless losers. And so we'll lose elections. All because of me. Yeah. And winning elections, that's the first thing on your wish list. Equality, justice, education, poverty, and progress, they're second. If you don't win elections, it doesn't matter what's second. Eddie, did you see parallels uh, between the world in which Trial of the Chicago 7 is set in 1968 and the current world that we find ourselves in in 2020 with the sort of craziness of the landscape of the elections in the states and and the sort of mm. constant rift between what the people want and what the governments are giving and that always freaks me out you think like you've advanced all this way with civil rights and human rights and actually often you haven't at all did you find that with with your movie I what was weird about this movie is that Aaron Sorkin wrote it I think 14 or 15 years ago and and it's taken that long to get made we finished filming in like late november last year and then since we finished filming it's just sort of become sort of scarily and eerily re relevant in a way that no one predicted obviously the black lives matter movement was um or is rooted in its own well it's its, its own uprising rooted in systemic racism but there are many sort of some sort of mirroring things that took place in 68. Um, it, obviously in 68, you had the Vietnam War that they were protesting, but you also had the civil rights movement. There was the women's rights movement following year. There was Stonewall. There was even, there was um, the, uh, the flu pandemic in 68, 69. You had a former vice president running for president it, and you had someone campaigning on law and order and it just became, it, every day since we finished filming, it just became more and more pertinent. They concluded that there was no conspiracy 
to incite violence during the convention. What's been interesting is the film was meant to be released by Paramount in the cinemas, and, and I think that Aaron really wanted it out quite sort of urgently, and so at Netflix I did up um, sort of releasing the film, and the extraordinary thing is it's gone into households across the world where democracy is being ch challenged frequently, and, and, and it has been seen. I remember listening to a podcast with Jessica Chastain saying there's literally the difference between the dot, dot, dot and the sort of dot, dot and what the, you know, the, the, the specificity is huge. And I wondered whether how you found it with, with John Patrick Channing, whether there was a sort of a, a sense that did you, had you read the play? Did you guys shift anything in the adaptation working with him, obviously writing and directing um, Wild Man's Time? No, I mean, I didn't read the play and I spoke to Shanley about that um, before we started shooting. And I said, should I make myself, you know, very in tune with what you did with the play with Outside Mullingar, what the play was called. And he was like, he was like, no, no. I was like, okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, he just, it, it, it just, he, he saw this as a separate thing. You know, it, it lived in its own world and, it, you know, it's not a play. I, like, you know, I haven't really done a play, and uh, but it, that feels like the closest thing I have done to date. You know, it, many of the scenes very much felt like um, like uh, theatre. One of the things I loved about the movie was getting to see you play something that I haven't seen you play before that is so playful, capricious, like... Um, slightly weird, um, like all, all of these uh, like wonderful colours that whereas I feel like until, you know, certainly early on in your career, you were sort of being uh, in a wonderful way playing, lead, you know, full sort of traditional leading man. Um, the, and, but I wonder if like the vibe being, because it was risky, I thought a lot of what you did was really involved a great confidence in this film um, mm. to, to be played in the way that you were and to, uh, to risk stuff. And do you think that was because of the the, as you say, the kind of like environment that you were all playing in. I, I think that's an element of it. And also able to be confident playing someone who has no confidence because yeah. um, I don't have a lot of confidence, you know, and, and, and we, we all have huge insecurities as actors for the most part, or most act, any actor I like is insecure in person, you know, and is, is, is uh, harsh on themselves and is terrified on day one. And I see still kind of a bit terrified on the final day. And, and I like that. And I think it's a great energy to, to approach it with. I feel like with Anthony, I'm able to express all of my insecurities and all of my awkwardness and all of my weirdness that I have as Jamie, I was able to express through him, which, as you say, I played a lot of men who are very much in control and who are very confident and assured of what they're doing. And I get to play someone who's at the total other end of the spectrum. We're so lucky that we're both sat here talking, you know, working with John Patrick Shanley and Aaron Sorkin, and we're, we've just been given these, these words and we, also both know how hard it is to sell words that you don't believe in and that yeah, are yeah. that are that are tricky you know you know i sort of live by that peter o'toole quote like great words make great actors and but there's a sort of sadness i found when when the words are that good and similarly to your film ours was shot in you know next to no time and but there was a slight desperation that when the words are that good that they can be like they can be heaved around they could be played in thousands of sure. different ways I, I found that the, this very unique feeling on on the Chicago Seven was going home at night, going, "Oh, I, I don't get to say, I don't get to say those again." There's these green fields, and there's us. Whatever that is, it holds me here. I'd love to ask, uh, um, Macy, about working with Emily Blunt because obviously I, I think you've known Emily and and John Krasinski a wee bit beforehand through. Um, Stanley Tucci and, and Fee Blunt. How was that? And is it, I've never actually worked with someone who's a, a sort of pal beforehand. And is it wonderful or is it awkward or is it, is it complicated? Well, it's funny because, you know, in my head, I did know Emily a wee bit. She doesn't remember really meeting me ever, which is really embarrassing. So actually, when we knew we were both doing this, you know, odd little um, film together, Emily sort of said to, to Fee, like, got to arrange a dinner because I don't really know Jamie. And Fee was like, you do, you've met Jamie? And she was like, oh, I don't really remember. Have I? I don't really remember meeting him. <laughs> so we had this dinner in, uh, in, uh, at, a, at an Italian restaurant in Barnes and just Millie and I and Fee and, and Emily. And um, 
it, you know, for me, it was like, hey, mate, we, we, we're, we're pals. <laughs> for her, it was like, like, we're going to get to know this guy. <laughs> but instantly, um, you know, because I know her sister so well, and Emily is just the easiest person to be around and get on with, you know, and makes it so easy. It was very instant, like sort of chemistry and appreciation of each other, respect and ease with each other. And I think after that dinner, both of us came away going, yeah, this is going to be, this is going to be fun. You know, this is going to be, um, this is going to be uh, not easy, but like it, so much of that movie and that relationship hinges on the two of us having something that works. I remember speaking to you and being like, and like, what are you up to? And you're like, I'm in Ireland with Emily Blunt, just, and I think Millie was there and John Krasinski was there. And I, I, I remember feeling like fiendish jealousy. I just thought that sounded like a really, like I've got sort of friend envy. Um, but uh, was but, it a fun experience? Yeah, I mean, it was an incredible experience. You know, I, I've never had, um, I've never done a job where I, I was so, physically like bereft when I finished it you know I really was it's also one of those jobs mate we're in we're in the west of Ireland where it's an all-Irish crew um everyone's ha having a good time like it's just one of those crews where it's buoyant you know you can feel it everyone's having a good it's raining all the time no one cares we're getting to say these lovely words everyone's just really easy there's no there's no one bringing any sort of drama we getting to work with Christopher Walken, you know, and Emily and John. When I finished, I when we were at, uh, I went into my trailer and I sort of collapsed. I had this strange physical reaction to 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 not getting to to have another day with these people on the set, you know. And I sort of kind of collapsed and kind of cried, and it was like, yeah, when does that happen with work? You know, it's it's very rare. Um, I'm sitting here talking about working with Emily Blunt and Christopher Walken and. It actually was a joy for me because they were all just really relaxed. And was that the same situation that you had? It was a kind of riveting three weeks on, on many levels. Uh, firstly, just being able to, to be, be in a scene and just listen, basically. We didn't have time for close-ups generally, so it was everything was wide shot. So you never, that wonderful thing where you never know what's being caught. You're just kind of reacting. Mm. Um, but the people that you're reacting to are sort of heavyweights um, and all with completely different processes. So it wasn't like a masterclass really, but it was also that thing of a masterclass in, in watching how people behave on set, like how they're living their lives, how they, what choices they make um, all around um, the film that I found is sort of endlessly compelling really. I mean, did you get a chance to rehearse? I don't think you had a huge amount of rehearsal, did you? No. I adore Aaron. He's also for someone that has the reputation for being a stickler for the minutia in the mm. word. Like he's also one of the most generous spirited people and self deprecating people. And he's fucking funny. He's, uh, um, he would always, he, it, his words are, it's a bit of a cliche, but are like music to him. And he, there would be times when you'd hear him literally listening to the rhythm of the, uh, of the words. Mm. And how about John? John was very economical in his notes and, and I, listen, I love being directed, you know, I really do. You know, I'll go in with an, a feeling that I feel that I want a feeling of the overall um, scene and um, I feel I'll have a good grasp on the, the sort of physicality and the, and the sort of general tone of the character, but I'm still very open to being manipulated a bit if, if I'm not in the right place with it you know and I think the best the best note he ever gave and he gave it to myself and he gave it to Emily uh, a couple of times and he gave it to me a couple of times was he just come in and said just whisper it just whisper it brilliant you Buster. know and actually it's an amazing note because it just takes away every other thing that you're trying to do with it you know you're not <laughs> it's not like he's the you don't, you know, if you don't do that, you don't whisper it, but it just, it takes, and he also had this thing of just take the air out of it. He'd say that sometimes. How many days do we have while the sun shines? It's not shining. I believe that it is. We've all worked with directors sometimes who they can't, ex you know, they're, they're finding a million ways to try to tell, tell you to let some of the air out. And um, actually all you need to say is that and you, every actor totally gets it. I love you. Yeah, I, yeah, I, 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 me, giving me the note to whisper it because like I've, I've done so many films that have been like whole sort of articles written about the fact that I was inaudible <laughs> but man, come on. I think we're the opposite Could just a bit better articulated and slightly louder please 
British, huh? Yes. First trip to New York? Yes. Anything edible in there? No. I was with you when uh, we were in Istanbul together when you yeah. found out you were definitely doing Fantastic Beasts. And mm. I remember just, we were all just so excited. It was just like, I celebrated like I just got some big job. And it was such a lovely thing to be with you because uh, you would had a rough year the year before winning, you know, uh, the clean sweep on the award circuit. But what uh, what can we expect from the third installment of Fantastic Beasts? Um, maybe I can't tell you anything. Um, okay. I can't tell you anything other than the fact that I've been doing lots of night shoots in Watford, um, in Leavesden, uh, and and uh, and I've been lots of night shoots that, that we were meant to shoot in the summer in water. Uh, so I've been sort of in water outside that we were meant to shoot in the summer, but now obviously because of lockdown and we the film shut down and and so now they're being shot in kind of late November, early December, and and you know that thing where you look at a schedule and you're like, firstly. I'm very lucky to be um, employed but secondly looking at the schedule going oh yeah yeah, that's down the line and then suddenly you find yourself um sort of swimming outdoors in a, in a British winter I mean when when you come for dinner I can tell you anything I said I can't even tell you everything because that would be the NDA that I signed and oh wow okay uh, <laughs> yeah bye dude see you soon bye mate